<laughs> Today's guest speaker is Robert Bob Hupp, Syracuse's Stage Artistic Director. For the sake of definition, what does an artistic director for Syracuse Stage do and is responsible for it? We handed out these definition sheets and it would be good for you to get a clear understanding of the responsibilities of uh, an artistic director. In January of 2016, Syracuse University announced that Robert Hubb had been named the artistic director at Syracuse Stage for the past for the past 16 seasons. Bob Hubb has served as producing artistic director of Arkansas Repertory Theater. What's going on in Arkansas? Look, they, they come from the east. Hupp has enjoyed a long and distinguished career as an artistic director and educator. From 1989 to 1990, he was the artistic director of the acclaimed Jean Cotreau Repertory of New York. That was in the city? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hupp also served as, on the board, board of the Theater Communications Group, a nonprofit theatrical organization in the city, New York, and has served as a panelist and a site educator for the National Endowment of the Arts. Theater is best served when the artistic leader rolls up his sleeves and engages in the issues that affect the aspects of life in the community, says Hubb. Artistic leadership means bringing the creative voice of the theater to the community. My philosophy, he quotes, is theater is tied to the idea that we have the rare opportunity to create important commercial experiences for our audience. I'm not crazy about the word commercial. It was communal. Oh, oh, communal. <laughs> I'm not crazy about the word commercial either. <laughs> now, when it comes to the arts, I've mean, got a dismissive art book. That we have an opportunity, a great opportunity, to create a communal experience for our audience. There you go. That's different than commercial. Yeah. <laughs> Up has held faculty and administrative positions at Dickinson and the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Guess who comes from Little Rock? Where, at the, the latter, he helped restructure the Department of Theater and Arts and Dance and served as the interim director. Hope brings with him a strong commitment to community service as evidenced by his involvement in Little Rock of the Arts and the Cultural Commission there. And can, and Kansa Arts Festival? A Kansa. Kansa. Uh, Kansas. That's kind of Arkansas and Kansas. It's a, it's, a, it's a Native American uh, word for what that area used to be called. Oh. So there's that Kansas Indians. Uh, they are Washita Indians. Nothing to do with Washington. No. Uh, <laughs> D.C. No. or the state? Neither one. How lucky they are. <laughs> Vision of Little Rock and the Little Rock our cultural attractions group. He has also been a part of the Creative Economic Advisory Board for the state of Arkansas. Maybe you ought to come here to New York State and do that too. Please, a super warm September welcome to Bauhaus. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so it always makes me nervous when somebody wishes me good luck when I start a talk. That's yeah. oh, uh, well, I know most of these guys are, and they're not easy. Believe me. <laughs> I, 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 I thought that was going to be a tough crowd. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? If at any point, point I wander away from this mic and you can't hear me, just let me know. I, I'll use my theatrical voice uh, and speak up. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, you mentioned the Akanza Festival, which we were just talking about, which is a, an arts festival in Arkansas that I'm proud to say is currently run by my, one of my children. Uh, uh, and uh, um, so it, it has it, it's, its opening this week as well. So it's a busy time in my family. Uh, but I'm very glad to be here and to be talking to you about Syracuse Stage and about our upcoming season. Uh, I'll talk for a little while and then I'll open it up for questions. I would welcome uh, what you want to talk about. I'd like, love, love to hear what you would want to talk about. This is an informal conversation, so at any point uh, I say something you want to know a little bit more about or have a question about, please just let me know. I'm glad to, to answer questions as we go as well. Uh, I just wrapped up my first season as artistic director at Syracuse Stage, uh, and uh, now in my second season. Uh, I was born and raised on the East Coast, uh, spent 17 years in Arkansas, uh, which was kind of like an extended study abroad program for me, uh, um, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. My my kids grew up there, 
Uh, and uh, I loved being in Arkansas. I loved creating theater uh, in uh, Little Rock. Uh, and um, am also very glad to be here in Syracuse and Central New York uh, to get to create theater for all of you. Uh, it is uh, um, a, a distinct honor to be an artistic director. Uh, and I love what I do. It is an incredibly collaborative experience. Uh, you know, I, we, we talked about uh, Syracuse University. So, uh, Syracuse Stage is entering its 45th season. And we are the professional nonprofit resident company at Syracuse University. We are a completely distinct entity from Syracuse University. We have our own board of directors. I'll talk more about that in a second. But we are in residence uh, at the university. Let's hop on to that next slide. Uh, many of you, if you've been around, how many of you are subscribers to Syracuse Stage? I'd like to change that demographic if we could over the next few days. How many of you attend the shows in the last couple of years at Syracuse Stage? And thank you very much for coming to see us. Um, I have no slide there right now. Oh, is that the video? the video? Ah, well, let's kick things off about our new season then and take a look at this video. Everything you see from Syracuse Stage is created in-house by our own team. Uh, they do a fantastic job. That was all equipment and all the other the, the gear and the web. We got all we got all the stuff. Absolutely, yep. So we can do everything in-house. Would you like to handle the discussion group that lives out in Manlius? About what? Would you like that? Oh, you mean do we want to? Oh, we want to market this for you? Yeah. Uh, we got our hands full right now. Okay. I think. Uh, I got my hands full. Okay, I understand. Okay. Um, but anyway, they do a great job, and that's. I'll, I'll get back to. I'm going to touch on each of those plays as we get into this conversation a, a little bit about the evolution of that season. Uh, I am uh, honored to be the fifth in line of a distinguished group. In this case, of all gentlemen uh, who have led Syracuse Stage as the artistic director. Uh, and uh, so as it says there, I've just been here about a year, and there's a big difference when you come to, uh, uh, and I've run, I've had the privilege of, of being the artistic director of three theaters, one in, in Manhattan, one in Arkansas, and one in Syracuse. As you can imagine, really different animals. Uh, the, the theater company uh, that I ran in New York was a classic rep company. Uh, uh, basically, we did plays by dead Europeans. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, then I went to Arkansas, where the focus was, uh, in many ways, on musical theater and in, and, and in creating of new work. Here in Syracuse, uh, we kind of split the difference. Uh, it's uh, focused on uh, adventurous work, the classics, some musicals, uh, and of course our partnership with the uh, university, and specifically the Department of Drama, is a very distinguishing characteristic of how Syracuse stage functions and our identity uh, in, in the community. Uh, Tim Bond was my immediate predecessor. Uh, he is now at the University of Washington, where he's on faculty there in Seattle. We, we, we talk frequently. Uh, Bob Moss uh, is still around and still directing, and I see him all the time. 
and we get together and, and talk about theater. He is an incredibly inspirational man, the founder of Playwrights Horizons in New York City, uh, and we were fortunate to have him. Uh, Taswell Thompson is the one artistic director that I, that, I, that I haven't met, well, I didn't meet Arthur Storch either, but he's passed a few years ago. Um, and Taswell continues to direct primarily opera uh, around the country and also is a playwright uh, whose plays are done in some of our major regional theaters. Uh, so I'm honored to be in that group of, of uh, people who have led Syracuse Stage over its 45 years. The average tenure of an artistic director in the United States is seven years. Uh, you know, we are kind of like itinerant preachers uh, in that we kind of travel around the country. There are around roughly 1,200 nonprofit theaters in the United States. Of those 1,200, there are a group of 74 that belong to an organization called the League of Resident Theaters. And that is the largest 74 theaters in the country. And they come together as a collective bargaining unit to negotiate with agents, since, uh, with, uh, with unions, since a big part of my job is defined by how we interact with various labor unions. So, uh, so we have a collective bargaining organization, and the, the largest, let's say 75, theaters are invited to join that organization. Syracuse Stage is a member of that League of Resident Theaters. So there are 74 other jobs like mine in the United States. So that's a kind of a, a, a rarefied group. Um, and you know, like we, we, all, we all know each other. We all get together a couple of times a year, talk about different things. We, we talk about productions. We talk about different projects we want to do. Uh, but it is a fairly small group of people. And this year, there are, I think, almost 20 of these jobs are turning over. Uh, uh, there was a crop of artistic directors a generation older than me who are all retiring, and so this is a, a time of great change in the American theater movement. So in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see new directions uh, taking shape all over the country as the field, as the profession of nonprofit theater evolves and changes with an incredibly uh, large turnover of artistic directors. Let's hop over to this other slide. Now, the thing about Syracuse Stage uh, that makes it uh, an interesting and rare animal, there are only, uh, of course, as I mentioned, you know, we're in this top 74 group of theaters. Uh, Syracuse Stage is the second largest theater company in New York State outside of New York City. Uh, the largest is the Jiva Theater in Rochester. Uh, and then we're the second, uh, second largest in the state. Uh, and we, we uh, perform for about 65,000 patrons a year. About 65,000 people come to campus to see a play at Syracuse Stage. We have an operating budget of about $6 million. Uh, and about half of that comes through ticket sales, maybe a little less than half comes through ticket sales, and the rest of that comes from contributions. Uh, so, and that's, uh, that's typical, that puts us in the larger range of regional theaters in the country, probably in the top, I'd say, 15% of theater companies in terms of budget size. Uh, we have about 55 uh, uh, employees, not to mention all the people that we bring in also from the university. And that doesn't count the artists that we hire, which primarily come either from uh, mainly New York City, but also the Chicago area and places around the country. Uh, one of the casts of this year will come from the next play we're doing, Curious Incident, is uh, I cast that in Chicago, uh, but the play we're doing Three Musketeers right now, I cast that in New York. So. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, a completely separate entity from the university. We have our own board of directors. We have a 50-member board of directors. Now, the university does have connections to us and, and mandates that seven of our board members are employees of the university, including our board president, B. Gonzalez, uh, who is uh, a vice president of the university, has been with the university for 30 years. We also have a chairman who is a member of the community. And that's a unique, that's, as I mentioned, there's only about 16 theater companies in the country that have a similar structure. And we're the only company that I know of in the United States that is associated with an undergraduate program. Most of the theaters that are like us are associated with graduate programs. Uh, so we have a unique uh, relationship and we have this independent structure with our board of trustees who provide all the governance, uh, fiduciary responsibility, oversight of the organization. They meet six times a year, uh, and they are the uh, they are the responsible entity for Syracuse Stage. Now we are tied, obviously, to the university because we provide support services for the Department of Drama. 
So when you come down to Syracuse stage, you might see one of six plays. We produce six plays a year. But we also produce all of the drama department productions. They do five plays. So our shops, all of our craftsmen and craftswomen who are building the sets and making the props and making the costumes, the marketing team, the box office team, all provide services for the drama program as well as the professional program in residence. Most of us on, on uh, the, the staff of Syracuse Stage teach uh, in the program. This year, the Syracuse Stage Drama Program was uh, ranked number four in the nation. Uh, it's one of the highest ranked, pro highest ranked programs at the university. It is harder to get into uh, the Syracuse Drama Program than any other program at the university. The acceptance rate is the lowest of any department at the university. Our drama program, fourth in the nation, is as successful as it is because of its partnership with Syracuse Stage. Because we bring young, aspiring professionals into direct contact with working professionals all up from all over the country to learn, to have experience working with them on stage. Uh, Playbill.com, which is one of the sort of, uh, if you go to a play on Broadway, you've got to have a playbill in your hand. They recently did a uh, survey of Broadway productions. Syracuse, Stay, Syracuse Drama ranked eighth in the nation for having the most alums on Broadway. Now, what's particularly unique about that is that we are exclusively an undergraduate program. Most Broadway actors have advanced degrees. Uh, but a lot of our Syracuse uh, drama students working with Syracuse Stage come right out of our program as 22-year-olds and get work all over the country. There was a new production of uh, 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 coming to Broadway of a musical called Mean Girls. Uh, it's being created by Tina Fey, uh, based on the movie Mean Girls. We have three Syracuse University alums in this upcoming production, and one of them graduated in May and is ending up on Broadway. And if you saw uh, uh, Mary Poppins at the rep last uh, at Syracuse stage last uh, winter, last uh, during December, you saw him in that production. So it is a wonderful partnership that benefits Syracuse stage and greatly benefits Syracuse University, all led by a wonderful board of trustees. Let's let's see that next slide. Now, uh, as a nonprofit organization, as a professional nonprofit organization, our job as theater artists is, and my job as artistic director is to, one of, one of, part of my job is, is picking the season, is, is selecting the plays that we're going to do, and then casting them, and then bringing together the directors and all the people who are going to create the projects. But our job is not necessarily just to produce plays that are going to sell a lot of tickets. We could do that, uh, but that's not our mission. That's not why we are given nonprofit status. We would be a we would be the landmark if that was our mission, which was to sell a lot of tickets. We, our job is to serve the community through the art of theater. To produce plays, yes, that will sell tickets because we have to stay in business if we want to achieve our mission. But our mission is also to, prevent, to present a diverse array of plays. Plays that entertain, but plays that also challenge and engage and sometimes educate and sometimes uh, 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 take us to, to, to experiences that we can't get anywhere else and that we might not ever have contemplated until we've come into the theater and experienced the story that unfolds in the Archbold Theater. Is that, is that the next slide? Uh. Um, many of you have been in this theater. It is a 500 seat uh, theater and the coolest thing about the Archbold is that you're never more than 50 feet away from the stage. To me, the best part about live theater is that up close personal experience that you can't get in some of our larger commercial houses that again are there to make a profit so they got to get as many people, they're like an airplane, they got to get as many people in as they possibly can to continue to make the huge amounts of money it takes to run a commercial theater. So uh, the Archbold is an intimate space where you're never more than 50 feet away from what the actors are doing. Now, we are in the business. My job, primarily, end of the day, bottom line is, I'm a storyteller. My job is to tell stories. Now, it gets more complicated than that, but bottom, end of the day, I'm a storyteller. Now, as a director, and I'm in the process now of directing my first play at Syracuse Stage, 
the Three Musketeers. As a director, you know, if I was a painter, I would, in many ways, when I'm creating a work of art, I would decide uh, how big is my canvas is going to be. What, uh, 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 you know, if I'm writing a book, I might want to tell a story. Is this a short story? Is it going to take me 800 pages to tell this story? As a director, as a guy who tells stories in theater, my work is dis defined by the architecture of where I'm creating the work. If I'm, and, and, and this is my first uh, venture in this theater. So it's very different if I'm, let's say I'm doing A Midsummer Night's Dream. If I'm doing it in a, in a park outdoors, that creative process and that, what, what kind of space I have, where the trees are, where the water is, that's gonna define how I tell this story. Well, the, the Archbold is what we call a, a proscenium theater. That is to say, it, the audience all sits over here, and there's a proscenium arch that frames the picture, and inside this picture frame, we're gonna tell the story. That is a very particular and pretty common uh, theater architecture, a proscenium theater, where the story is framed inside a, a box for all intents and purposes. There's lots of other different kinds of theaters in the round or thrust or uh, different kinds of experimental spaces, but we have a proscenium theater, an intimate proscenium theater, and so I'm, I'm evolving my storytelling with this production of The Three Musketeers. And how, it, that affects everything about how you hear in the space, how the lighting works, uh, what the actors' voices sound like when they're, where they're in different parts of, of the building. These are all the things that we work on when we work in the Archbold Theater. So as artists, as theater artists, we are painting our stories in the canvas of the architecture that we're working in. And every, every director approaches the play differently based on the architecture of the space where the story is being told. Let's go to another slide. As I mentioned, we do six productions a year on our main stage. But that's just the part of the iceberg of our organization that's above the water. There's so much more of our organization that a lot of people aren't familiar with. A big part of our nonprofit mission is not just to uh, create plays and sell tickets, but also to provide educational services. We know uh, how challenged our school systems are to provide the arts uh, for young people. And we also know that if we can get young people engaged in the arts, they are better citizens, they are better learners, uh, they have a better quality of life, uh, and so it is very important to us as a nonprofit organization, go back to that last slide a second for me, uh, it's much more important that we also provide educational activities and educational opportunities to the young people of central New York. We do that in many ways. We're just sending out a children's uh, play that we write in-house. It's created by our own uh, director of education that will reach thousands of elementary school students across central New York. Uh, that just literally, go, we just finished working on that. That goes out on the road uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we do a program called Backstory, where we take historically significant characters, write a, a backstory about their lives, and then send these individuals, actors portraying these individuals, into the classroom. Uh, it could be uh, a, a, um, a, a factory worker from central New York in the, uh, uh, the 19th century. It could be Harriet Tubman. It could be uh, 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 any number, we, as, much, as big as we can dream uh, in terms of the people that we create. We send these actors in character into the classroom to interact with junior high school and high school students. Uh, so it's a history lesson, it's an acting lesson. They get to interact with the characters. Uh, and so we do that every year uh, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, spring, once our educational tour comes off the road. Uh, we have uh, a program that I'm very fond of called the All Stars, where we worked with where we work with uh, developmentally disabled adults uh, in the evenings to create uh, theater experiences. And some of the best we do a, uh, once a year, we they do a performance for us, and it is one of the most fun, moving uh, experiences in the theater to see uh, all all these men and women light up on the stage and to see their families come and watch them perform. It is really a wonderful uh, aspect of our educational uh, outreach. Uh, we do a playwrights competition for, uh, for high school students. We had over 300 high school students enter this competition last year. Uh, and 10 minute plays and our staff reads every single play uh, and uh, gives feedback and brings uh, the students to do uh, the, the finalists and the winners to do uh, presentations on our stage. 
Uh, that is a very popular uh, program that we do. Something that we added last year was sensory friendly uh, performances. We just started that, and what that is, we did it for Mary Poppins, we're doing it this year for The Wizard of Oz. We, for, for a day, we recreate the theatrical experience that makes it comfortable and available to families, uh, to uh, young people and adults who are on the autism spectrum. Oftentimes, uh, when you're on the autism spectrum, the loud noises and the crowds of a theater are uncomfortable places. And so working with consultants from across the country, we've created experiences. Uh, we had a very successful program last year. We're doing it again this year, where we adjust how we do the production uh, and, and adjust the entire experience uh, for uh, young people and adults on the spectrum. Uh, and so that's another part of our programming that a lot of people don't know about, but something that's very important to all of us and serves a, a very important part of our community. Uh, and so we do student matinees, and, and you can go to the other slide now. I think the next slide is, these are the, the finalists of, of our uh, Young Playwrights competition last year. We do the standard stuff you would expect a theater company to do. We do uh, the student matinees, we provide study guides, we send our artists into the classrooms to meet with young people. Uh, we want to do everything we can to make the arts a part of the lives of our young people, because we know how important it is we know that it is an invaluable uh, aspect of what we do, uh, and it's something that it drives a large part of our daily operations, is the educational components. And of course, you know, being on campus on, on a, in a university setting, we have lots of engagement with uh, college students uh, through internships and apprenticeships uh, and varieties of ways that students, there. every professional, backstage professional, administrative professional, at Syracuse stage is attached to a student apprentice or a student intern. I have two of them right now working with me. Uh, and everybody in our organization is mentors young aspiring professionals. And that's just part of our daily existence, part of our DNA as being the resident theater company at Syracuse University. Providing not just the actors opportunities, but also future administrators, future props masters, future, future uh, technical directors, future marketing directors, uh, the Newhouse School provides internships in the marketing department, so we really serve not just the drama department, but the entire university uh, community uh, in this. Yeah, yes, sir? So some of the kids at Mentor decide they want to do a, a different thing and change around within different roles? Yeah, we, you mean in terms of within the organization? Does an actor decide, heck, I want yes. to be a director? And yes, one of my interns right now who's working as my assistant on The Three Musketeers started out as an actor and realized that she was more interested in learning how to become a director. So the university, the, the department was, is, is very flexible in that regard. Uh, we have 250 majors in our program. It's a big program. And you can imagine with 250 majors, they get there as 18 year olds, and you know, maybe this isn't right for me, maybe I'm more interested in this or that. So the department is, is as flexible as it can be to make sure, okay, let's shift them over here. And some of them might leave the program entirely. Maybe they'll end up in another college at, at SU. Uh, and that happens too. And, and that's, you know, that just with that many majors, uh, that kind of thing happens. I wouldn't say all the time, but it does happen. And, and of course the students, the, the caliber of the students, uh, they, they have to pass various criteria to continue with the program. I mean, they are evaluated constantly. Uh, and sometimes they wash out. Uh, and so it's not just pay the money and, and stay for four years. They have to, they are constantly evaluated uh, and, and uh, they have to earn the advancement through the four year program. You know, our students, they, <laughs> they are pretty good. I mean, I, I mean, when I look back upon my own college experience, our, and one of the reasons they're as good as they are is that in their junior year, they spend a semester in London learning all about theater. And in their senior year, they spend a semester in New York City. And so we immerse them in the New York City world before they even graduate. They've met agents, they've met casting directors, uh, they've been instructed by working professionals. Uh, these students, they, they, they learn how to live in New York City. Uh, they, they learn the, all the, the side of the business, you know, because at the end of the day, when you're an actor, you're, you're in a business. You're, you're, you're selling yourself as opposed to a product. You're the product and you have to learn, no matter how good you are, you still have to know the ins and outs of the business to make a living at it. Who manages these, who, these students in the city? Well, our department chairs a guy named Ralph Zito who comes to Syracuse University from the Juilliard School. Uh, he is in charge of the whole thing. Then we have a whole other separate 
uh, group of people, of, 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 of related faculty in the city who teach the classes and do everything uh, there. They're working professionals who are doing this with, you know, uh, with the university. We, so you know, the students there are responsible and answerable to certain people in the city watching them on a oh absolutely street. we have a full com we have a full contingent of faculty in new york city just like they're having here they are they are it, it, we just basically move the whole program down to new york city for a semester for our seniors yeah and so it's 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 highly highly supervised but they also i mean this is a this is a tough profession in the acting world on any given day the unemployment rate is 85 mm. percent and that's for that's for actors who are already members of the union that doesn't count the non-union performers who are working for less than survival wages. Uh, but the members of the union, uh, who, whose salary is dictated by union uh, guidelines, 85% unemployment. And, and in order for an actor who's a member of the union to qualify for health insurance, they have to, they have to be employed by a lord or regional theater to at least 20 weeks out of the year in order to qualify for health insurance. So here you have an unemployment rate of 85%, where only 2% of the profession makes over $50,000 a year uh, at their profession. Now they might work as something else and make more money, but in terms of working in the profession, uh, it is a tough business. So we wanna make sure the students that we're, that's, that's why working in a professional company is so important because we continually provide reality checks. Now, we are not painting rosy pictures. We are talking about the beauty of our craft and the passion of our craft, but we're also doing it in the context of what it means to be in this profession. It's a tough profession. Getting back even to my job, there are 73 other people in the United States who have a job like mine. You think, then you think, well, how did you get that job? Uh, 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 but, uh, 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 so it is, it is a incredibly competitive world. Uh, that that we enter into that our profession supports um, Let's go to let's look at something else um, The other part of our Organization so you have the six plays we do you have the education And then the other part of what we do and the thing that I'm as passionate about as anything is Engaging with the community and that's that means that can mean many different things. I mean we have a lot of programs It is no longer okay to just do six plays and have people walk in the door for two hours and then walk out the door and go home and go about their world. Theater, all the arts, are evolving and changing as our world changes. Uh, and, uh, and if we are going to survive 30 more years, 40 more years as a non-profit professional theater company, we know that we have to do more than just produce plays. We have to provide broad experiences that allow people to really engage with our organization. We do that in many ways. We do that through talkbacks. We do that through coming and having dinner before the show. We do everything. We do dance classes and happy hours and uh, all these activities. Hopefully, encourage people to make Syracuse stage and more broadly the performing arts a part of a well-lived life. That people will engage in the arts in the way that they engage with sports, in the way they may engage with their faith community, in ways that we can come together as a community with shared values and, and, and differing values and have common experiences, have communal experiences. Because in this day and age, we are so isolated by our cell phones, by our computers, by how busy we all are, that we need these communal experiences. We need these conversations. And so Syracuse Stage works diligently, and we are always looking for new avenues of exploration. The marketing guys are always uh, engaged in new projects, new programs, about how we can enhance the experience of the arts for our community. Part of that means getting out of our building and getting into the community and doing work in other neighborhoods with other community partners. Part of it means forming partnerships with organizations that aren't arts organizations other nonprofits, perhaps, based on themes of the shows that we're doing. Uh, uh, you know, we're partnering, this next play we're doing, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, uh, where we're partnering with uh, Upstate, uh, with some projects uh, there. Uh, we partner with other community partners that help us reach 
other members of the community that we might not have average everyday contact with and who might not be folks like yourself who have come down to see Syracuse stage. We've got to uh, engage uh, diverse audiences, we've got to engage younger audiences and that is an ongoing uh, adventure. I will, I will use that word. That's, 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 the, that's the other slide. One of the most significant community engagement projects that has become a priority uh, for, has been a priority for me in my previous work in Arkansas and now here in Central New York is Syracuse Stage's engagement with veterans and active duty military personnel. Uh, to me, uh, there is no greater group for us to engage with, and we have learned nationally that uh, for veterans and for military families, for the families of deployed uh, uh, military, the theater, the performing arts, this communal experience is a special kind of engagement and it's very important. And we've seen it proven time and time again. Uh, this has been a big part of my focus for the last five years, is working with military families. Earlier this year, uh, we created a program called Separated. Separated was a play. Those uh, performers you see on the stage uh, and the service dog right there. Uh, those are uh, SU students who uh, are, one of them is active duty military, and the other seven are veterans. Uh, most of them served uh, in Iraq uh, or Afghanistan uh, and came back, took advantage of various uh, federal programs to get themselves enrolled at Syracuse University. Uh, they all have, uh, some of them uh, uh, are challenged with PTSD and other, uh, other uh, 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 challenges as a result of their service. Um, these eight students came together with our associate artistic director, Kyle Bass, who's also a playwright, and hearing their stories and using their own words, Kyle crafted a 90-minute play with these actors or these students as the actors, telling their own stories of their experience uh, in combat, their experience uh, in the military, their experience post-military, how they ended up in the military. Uh, this was a riveting story, and it got the interest of the chancellor and, 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 and Dr. Chen, the chancellor's wife. And so we've done this now for uh, the SU uh, trustees, we've done it for uh, uh, the general public, we've streamed it live on Facebook, uh, and then for Veterans Day, uh, this production is going down to New York City, and we're doing a performance of it in New York City uh, uh, for on the 13th of November to celebrate Veterans Day at the Paley Center, which is at CBS, uh, CBS headquarters there in New York City. So these eight uh, student veterans will go down and tell their very moving stories uh, to uh, an audience in New York City. So we're very excited for them, very excited this program continues to live. It's an example of how we want to actively engage in the military. We, we do, we have military families, we have uh, special uh, nights, uh, what we call Blue Star Nights uh, at the theater for military families. We've just launched a brand new initiative. We're gonna be up uh, uh, at some, in some of the schools near Fort Drum, where we're going to be doing uh, a theater program with uh, high school students whose families, mom and dad, mom or dad, are active duty military. Uh, and doing a theater, they're gonna be creating a theater piece uh, about their own experience uh, working with uh, the schools up around uh, Fort Drum. Uh, so uh, again, getting not just providing, which is very important, providing opportunities for military families to come and see work uh, and, and experience theater, but also to participate in the creative process. We find, that, we find that that is the most profound engagement with our, with our military families and particularly with our vets. How do you judge creativity and how do how do you find it out? How do you dig it out of the woodwork, these creative people? How do, how do they become exposed to your... Uh, it, oftentimes it's a happy accident. Uh, but um, other times it's providing the environment where people are encouraged to feel like, and, and, and where they can express themselves without fear of failure. Um, you know, we spend, and I raised, you know, my wife and I have five kids, and we spent a lot of time, them growing up, telling them, no, don't do that. So in a creative environment, with adults or with children, you find ways of not saying, no, don't do that. You find ways of saying, what do you mean? You know, as a director, 
there's, a, there's an adage as a director that says you can direct an entire play by just saying, let's try that. And that the actors will, now, nobody does that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but theoretically, you could say, let's try it. If you had all the time in the world and all the money in the world to just kind of play in a room, you say, let's try it. Got an idea? Let's try it. And that's how we try to foster creativity. Everybody's got creativity inside of them. Some of, people, some of us are just have it more accessible, have it more uh, bubbles to the surface more easily uh, for whatever reason. Um, but, uh, and I'm not trying to be all psychological about it, but, but certainly um, uh, finding an environment, like to get these veterans to tell their stories, very personal, sometimes heart-wrenching stories, required months of talking and, 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 and trusting. So they would tell those stories and then getting them to perform those stories when none of these people have ever been on the stage before, getting them to, now they're, they're reading it, they're not acting it out, we're not creating scenes, it's, it's, it's readings. But that's intimidating enough, you know, the, uh, uh, people tell us that the most, you know, the scariest thing to most people is speaking in public. Now even scarier than snakes or flying on an airplane. <laughs> Speak, speaking in public is supposed to be the scariest thing for a lot of people. So, so, so just creating an environment where they feel like they're valued and, uh, 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 and they can trust the people that they're working with to treat them fairly, uh, you'd be surprised with how that sparks people's creative energies. So that's, that's a thumbnail. It's a, a book about it, I'm sure. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. Oh, that. Can this, these, are, yeah, these are people talking at the circuit stage. Uh, um, the other thing that uh, we want to make sure we do, and I touched on this just briefly, uh, is we want to make sure that everything we do at Syracuse Stage is accessible to a broad citizenry. Uh, we just, this may be of interest to some of you, so this summer we went out and we raised money and we re replaced our entire assisted listening uh, uh, program. Well, I can't tell you the biggest complaint in my first year at Syracuse Stage, the single complaint I got was from our citizens who have uh, who are hearing need, need hearing assistance? That our assisted listening, the little things you put in your ears when you come to the theater, you, you, uh, were terrible. <coughs> that they didn't work well. That they were frustrating and hard to use. And so this year we did our research, we raised some money, and we replaced the entire system. We have a brand new assisted listening system. We also just replaced all our bathrooms. Um, um, you'd be surprised. It's a major deal. It's a big deal. Um, you know, I, I, people like to think, oh, you must have a great job where you spend all your time talking about theater and creative acting. And yeah, that's true, a big part of it. But then I also spend a lot of time talking about parking and bathrooms and hearing aids and everything that goes into the experience. Uh, it's not inconsequential. So just even adding uh, uh, accessible bathrooms, which we didn't have makes a difference to making people encouraged and, and, and happy about coming down to Syracuse stage. We know that people are busy. We know that people have choices. We know that we are not a cheap date. Uh, uh, and so we have to do all that we can to make people uh, comfortable and, 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 uh, and, and happy when they come down to see a play at, at, at Syracuse stage. Now I've talked a lot already about our partnership with the Department of Drama. Um, so, I, but I want to touch on, is, is the next, are we going into the shows? We yeah. are, fantastic. This helps me dovetail into Here Must Be Tears. Um, go, go into the next one. Um, I'm going to show you a little video in a second about, about some rehearsal of Here Must Be Tears. One of the things that um, makes the drama program stand out and makes it uh, the fourth best program in the country and makes it have so many applicants is because one of the things we do every year is we co-produce a production of, on our main stage with the Department of Drama. If you've come down to our holiday shows, White Christmas, uh, Hairspray, uh, Mary Poppins, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Pan, this year The Wizard of Oz, those productions are co-produced between Syracuse Stage and the University's Department of Drama. What does that mean? That means that students act on stage with professionals. And that means that we, Syracuse Stage, can do larger productions than we could otherwise afford to do. So it's kind of a win-win. Oftentimes, I defy you to tell the difference, besides age, 
I defy you to tell the difference between these excellent students and these actors, uh, professional actors coming from all over the country. And so, uh, so we do, our partnership uh, is a win-win. I think it's a win for the audience, for the drama program, and for Syracuse stage. Uh, and so uh, we produced this musical. So when I got here, I sat down with the faculty, and I said, okay, so we like this co-pro relationship. What, how can we enhance it? And of course, you know, we have students, the, big, the biggest uh, aspect of our students, the, the most, uh, most of our students are majoring in musical theater. But we also have a lot of students who are majored in straight theater, not musicals. And the faculty said, well, you do all these musicals as co-pros uh, with the musical theater students, but not for the, uh, the drama students. And I said, well, let's try for a year. Let's do two co-pros. Let's do one that's for the drama students that lets me do a big play. So, and that's just to back up a second. Uh, my training is in classical theater. My background is in Shakespeare. Uh, and that's what I, that's what I was trained to do. That's where I, after I went to college, I went to acting school, I went to a Shakespeare conservatory. I've done, I've worked in, 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 uh, most of my career been focused on Shakespeare. I'm attracted to big, epic plays. Messy, uh, you know, lots of things going on kind of plays. Uh, and The Three Musketeers was a play I never directed that I was very interested in. I, you know, said, so what's going to be my first play here in, in Syracuse? Well, I was very interested in Three Musketeers. The version I wanted to do had a cast of 18 actors playing about 40 roles. Well, that's a big cast for Syracuse stage financially for our 499 seat house. So let's say, let's, say, let's do it as a co-pro. Let's get these students who are non-musical theater majors and our actors together and create this story of the Three Musketeers. And so once I had landed on the, there's so many versions of the, there's like, you know, the Three Musketeers is one of the most uh, popular stories uh, in literature. Uh, it is one of the few stories that has been told in film seven times. Every 10 years, we get a new film version of The Three Musketeers. We, last one was 2011. Before that, it was 1997. Before that, it was 1973. Before that, it was during the Second World War. Before that, it was a silent film with Douglas Fairbanks. It goes on and on. There is a Barbie Three Musketeers. Uh, 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 it, there really is. It's, it's ridiculous, but there is a Barbie Three Musketeers. There is a Mickey Mouse Three Musketeers. Uh, it is one of the most uh, sought after stories because it is a story at the end of the day about love, about hope, about friendship. Uh, it's got villains and good guys, uh, and, and the good guys win. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, wonderful, timeless, and timely story. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to do it as our season opener. And I was so glad to partner with the drama program because even though there are different translations and different plays, there are different play versions of The Three Musketeers, none of them have four people in them. They all have, you know, you've got to have four musketeers. You've got to have the three guys in D'Artagnan. You've got to have the bad guys. I mean, it's, it's just a big show. So uh, uh, um, uh, that's why I'm excited. It's, it's our first non-musical co-pro with the drama program. And as you can imagine, one of the features of the Three Musketeers is lots of fights, lots of swords. Uh, and so um, uh, I brought in a buddy of mine that I've done 14 shows with. When you do a lot of Shakespeare, you do a lot of fights. Uh, and I brought in a buddy of mine uh, that, that I've done 14 shows with uh, to choreograph and direct the fights. I've often said in rehearsal that my job is as director is just to connect the short bits of dialogue between the fights. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, a, it's been a, a very fun experience. When you're creating fights, you've got to create it. It's got to be flashy. It's got to be fun. Most importantly, it's got to be safe. I've only got 18 actors. I can't knock one of them off. Uh, uh, so uh, we're trying to do stuff that looks very flashy, but that you can do eight or nine times a week and do it and not get hurt. Uh, no matter what you do, people do get hurt. It's just part of the deal when you've got weapons flying around in people's faces uh, all the time. But uh, uh, let me show you a little background. The fight director's name is DC Wright, uh, and I, we got a little video here of some of the fight rehearsal our first day on the set. So can we show that? The set's not finished on the, in this video, but uh, you can get a, no, did it go away? 
There it is. Hi, I'm Bob Hubb. I'm the artistic director here at Syracuse Stage. I'm also making my directorial debut here with the Three Musketeers. Today was our first day on the set. We're thrilled to be here. And I'm also thrilled to be with my buddy, D.C. Wright, who is our fight director and fight choreographer. D.C., tell us a little bit about creating the fights for the Three Musketeers. Sure, it's been a very exciting process, so working here at Syracuse Stage with the actors. Uh, we've been spending a couple weeks upstairs in a little room with tape on the floor, telling us what the confines of the set was going to be. And now, uh, as our first day here on the set, it's been very exciting to take those actors, move them around on the stage, navigate the stairs. We're working really slow to make sure that the actors are safe and that the uh, action is being presented in the way we want to do it. I have a lot of ideas when I'm working on the fight. I've talked with Bob and I've talked with the actors and I've read the script, of course. And so I have uh, ideas of a story that I want to tell, uh, that the script requires to tell. This particular one, um, this was the first time that D'Artagnan gets to fight with the Musketeers. He's just joined them as a group, and this is the first time they're kind of cohesive. So uh, it's, it was fun for me to start this one out. Uh, the Musketeers have a little salute thing that they have always done before they started fighting previously in the play. That D'Artagnan does not know yet. So the Musketeers are trying to do their little salute, and D'Artagnan just rushes out and starts the fight, and he engages a whole bunch of people, and the Musketeers are like, what's going on? So I started out with a little kind of confusion, uh, which I thought was kind of fun, um, and then I tracked it through. Um, I didn't want to have everyone just pair off with two people every time. It's significantly easier to choreograph that way, <laughs> for one, because uh, you, then I can kind of keep everyone separate. But I liked the idea for the musketeers to be seen helping each other out and having each other's back. So when one musketeer gets in peril, another musketeer is able to get in there and help save his buddy. So uh, there's a lot of changes that happen. They move from one partner to the other partner. As someone succeeds with one area, they're able to go help someone else. So there's some changes that happen, which I think makes the story more interesting for the actors to tell. It also, I think, makes it more visually interesting for the audience to watch the different traffic patterns that go on the stage. So I do a lot of that. It's a very fun, uh, dynamic, exciting process that I look to get to create the work in the space with the actors. Um, I really don't like choreographing anything beforehand and showing up in the room and just saying this is what it is. I like to be able to meet the actors. I like to see what their take on the character is. And I like to uh, see what the story is that they want to tell. Because that's what we're all about in the theater is telling stories. And the fights should not pop out and be separate from the play. They should just further the story of the play and the characters' uh, wants and needs. So uh, I like it when people come to the plays and they don't talk about fights as something that is unique or separate from the play, but it just blends right in and is natural to the world of the play. And so that's what I try to create when I'm putting together a big fight like this. Three Musketeers is an epic story of love and adventure. It opens on September 20. I hope you'll join us. That's a little background. That's a, 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 a social media promotion that we did just to talk about the background of the play a little bit. Uh, and we do open on the 20th of September, which is a week away. Uh, and uh, we are, we just moved from the rehearsal hall, as DC mentioned, down into the stage to get on that set. Uh, and are in the process on uh, Saturday, we add costumes and we have a resident, we, have, we, we brought in a resident composer to sit in rehearsal and write music while we were working. Uh, and so we'll have a, 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 an original score uh, for the production as well. Uh, uh, and for this production, I've brought in a lot of the design team that I'm used to working with over the past 20 years. Uh, so there's a lot of new uh, designers. Um, uh, on this production, if you're familiar with Syracuse Stage Productions, it'll be a new group of people uh, working with us. So uh, I hope you'll come and see The Three Musketeers when it opens uh, next week and runs, runs for three weeks. It is just the first of six productions that we're doing this season. The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime is based on the, uh, the bestseller, the novel. Um, we are doing this uh, in partnership with our friends uh, in Indianapolis, the Indiana Repertory Theater. Uh, Indiana Rep was built, the theater, I talked about architecture a while ago. Indiana Rep was designed by the same architect who designed Syracuse Stage, who also designed the Jeepa Theater in Rochester, same guy. So our theaters have similar footprints, which makes it financially viable for us to share productions. Uh, uh, and so I was glad to partner with The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Do you know the story? Uh, it, it's a story of a young, it's, the book is about a young man who has autism, who uh, uh, finds a dog uh, in his garden, dead dog, wants to know what happened to this dog. And so he goes on an exploration, and it, it, it opens up all kinds of 
fascinating stories about his life and his family, his mom and dad. It's a beautiful, beautiful play. The thing that distinguishes, and it was it won the Tony Award for Best Play uh, in New York City a couple of years ago. And the young man who played the lead won the Tony Award for Best Actor. Uh, and uh, so the rights just became available to regional theater, because it's still on national tour. And Syracuse Stage is one of the only 10 regional theaters in the country that got the rights to do this play. Uh, and so then we partnered with Indiana Rep. And the other cool thing, this is a story about a, a young man with autism, but the role of the young man has never been played by an actor who's on the spectrum. And so we will be the first theater company in the country to, who has hired an actor who's on the spectrum to play a character who's on the spectrum. Uh, and so, so last month I did it, this has attracted a huge amount of press. Last month I did an interview with the BBC. Uh, uh, so and it, it's, a, it's being created, it's opening uh, in Indiana as we speak, this week, next, ne next week, oh, same as Musketeers. Opens next week in Indiana, plays there in three weeks, then we pack it up and bring it here and it'll perform on our stage. Uh, and it's a fascinating play, uh, new play, uh, that I think is one of the best plays of the last four or five years. So that's our second season. Then The Wizard of Oz. It's been 18 years since we did The Wizard of Oz. I was excited about The Wizard of Oz for a bunch of reasons. I'm bringing in a director named Donna Drake that I love, who I've worked with before, who is a fantastically creative director. This is a co-pro with our Department of Drama, as all of our holiday shows are. But the neat thing about this production of The Wizard of Oz, it is the, is this, uh, the story that you know, but um, we're partnering with a company called Two Ring Circus. And I've, I've, these are actors uh, who are also circus performers. Uh, they do fantastic work, and their storytelling enhances musicals like The Wizard of Oz so wonderfully. And I, I, I've worked with them in, in Arkansas, and all, they, work, they work all over the country. And they will be part of our production of The Wizard of Oz. So we're having meetings about, okay, well, we need fireballs, and we need uh, you know, all these you know, shoes that spark, and we need all these things. And then all the work that they bring, all the aerial work that they bring to the show adds a different, wonderful dimension to a story we know and love. And here again, in this partnership with, our, with, with the students who get to be in the show, they get to learn a whole new skill set of, 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 of the uh, circus work that they wouldn't get to learn otherwise. Just like the actors, student actors who are in Three Musketeers now know how to use a sword. Uh, um, and they know how to die in a variety of different ways. Um, <laughs> Next to Normal is the second show that I'll be directing. That's uh, a musical. It is a musical drama, not a musical comedy. And it won the Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award for Best Musical uh, when it first came out in 2008, 2009. Rarely does a musical win the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, um, and not to mention jo and winning the Tony Award for, for, best, for best Musical. Um, it is a powerful story about a family, uh, about a woman who uh, uh, suff suffers from bipolar disorder, and the story that her family goes to, that's why it's called Next to Normal. Uh, it is one of my favorite musicals. It is a contemporary musical. It's a rock and roll musical. Uh, uh, and it is like no other musical I've ever seen. Uh, I, was, I wanted to do a musical in my, in my first season here, uh, and uh, we'd never done Next to Normal. Uh, it's one of the best scores I've ever heard. I was just in the city Monday, what's today, Wednesday? My day, our, the day, our dark day, the day we don't rehearse is Monday. Uh, we rehearse Tuesday through Sunday. So on Monday, I flew down to the city, did some auditions for Next to Normal, flew back, got back into rehearsal for, uh, for Three Musketeers, and then it's the show, as soon as it opens, I'll fly back to the city do another round of auditions for Next Normal. It's a hard show to cast because the roles are very demanding. Uh, but it's funny, it's, it, it, it's, uh, the story is, the characters are so well developed. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, family drama. Uh, and so uh, I'm excited about doing and directing Next Normal. What are January. the dates? Opens the end of January, runs for three weeks. The, the exact dates are in our brochure there. But January 24th. There you go, marketing <laughs> person knows. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? A Raisin in the Sun, the American classic. It's been over 20 years since Syracuse State did A Raisin in the Sun. One of the cool things about A Raisin, we're also doing that one in Indiana and in Syracuse. One of the cool things about A Raisin in the Sun, there was a particular director named Timothy Douglas, who's in my mind one of the best directors in the country. And he's directed here before, but not for about 12 years. I wanted to bring him back to direct something for us. I had seen his work, I just love his work. Uh, he really uh, is, a, a, is a wonderful storyteller. Uh, he was interested in revisiting A Raisin in the Sun, a play he has not done for a while. 
He had some great cast members in mind. And so it was a perfect marriage of a play that I wanted to do and a director that I was passionate about and really wanted to tell the story. So Raising the Sun is with us uh, in the spring. And then we wrap things up, let's go to the last slide, with a play you've never heard of called The Magic Play. It sold out its run in Chicago uh, this past year. Uh, I was fascinated by it because it is a play. It is a full bore play about a guy, a magician, but it's also an amazing magic show. This guy does stuff with cards you won't, I guarantee you, you won't believe what this guy can do. This play was written in Chicago for that actor. If anything happens to him, we have to change plays. There's only one actor in the country that can play the role because the magic is too hard. Uh, uh, and so uh, we hope we wish him good health. Uh, 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 and uh, so he did this play in Washington. He went from Chicago, I saw it in Washington, D.C. Then we're co producing it in Portland, Oregon. Then we're co producing it in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And then we're producing it here uh, in Syracuse. Uh, so it is a one of a kind play. It's a, it's a story about this guy and his relationship with his dad, his relationship with his partner, and he's a magician. And so he tells these stories, he illuminates his stories by creating these elaborate magic tricks. Um, and it's, it, you, it's taken hard to describe, but it's a very one of a kind theatrical experience that wraps up our current season and gets us a new play in our season as well. And speaking of new plays, we're creating a brand new program this year called Cold Read. This is a, uh, a series of new plays, new plays to us, brand new plays, that we're going to be presenting just for a weekend. Uh, we started out doing it in February, which we call, why we call it Cold Read, and then we had to move it into April. It's still kind of chilly. Uh, 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 but uh, it's, a, it's four days of new plays. We're bringing in a resident playwright to work with us, who also happens to be a, a, a former a Marine captain. He's working on a new play uh, uh, that focuses on veterans that we're interested in developing. Uh, and um, we're doing a... a uh, readings, uh, we're doing a new solo work, we're reading some new plays that were under consideration for Syracuse Stage, we want to get audience uh, opinion about. So uh, this is a brand new program we're doing and launching it uh, in, the, in the spring, in the late winter, uh, uh, called Cold Read. Uh, and most of those events are going to be free and open to the public. And that should wrap things up. That does just about wrap things up. You know, I mentioned all these things, but we're getting late on time. Uh, uh, these are the things that we do regularly, but I want to open up the questions, see what you guys want to talk about. Uh, um, what's on your mind? Sir? What would be the average budget for each play, and do you have to house and feed the professional actors? House, but not feed. Uh, an average budget for a musical is around three hundred fifty thousand. Uh, for a play that doesn't have music in it, uh, one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand, uh, on average for us. Uh, we have a partnership with the Genesee Grand Hotel, where uh, our at we we pay. I mean, we, we it's not a free thing, but they give us a wonderful uh, sponsor rate. And so our actors stay, the Genesee Grant not only has hotel rooms, but also has one bedroom apartments in their complex. Our actors tell us that it is some of the best housing in the country. It is a uh, block and a half from the theater. <clears throat> the actors have room service, they have uh, uh, maid service, they have a gym, they have a bar. Uh, uh, they would never want to leave. Uh, um, uh, so it is, and you know, actors, just like all of us, you know, when, that, when you do this for a living, when you live out of a suitcase, you care about where you stay and how well you're taken care of. It's a big deal. So we are able to attract even better actors than we would ordinarily because of our great housing, because they're interested in, in, in being comfortable when they're working somewhere. Uh, so yes, we, 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 it, because the apartments they stay in have kitchens, we don't have to feed them. If we house them in hotel rooms, we would have to feed them. If they, did, if they couldn't cook their own food, we have to give it to them. But since they can cook it and they can go to the grocery store, there's that, that's included in the salary we pay. Yes? I'm curious about sets. Um, the expenses, your role, you must mm -hmm. have a set director. Yep. So we have, a, uh, it's a big part of what we do, as you can imagine. So, so my job is to hire a designer, and the designer, uh, for instance, the, the set you'll see for the Three Musketeers, the designer that I've been working with, uh, you won't know him as a set designer, but if you ever watch the uh, Rose Bowl Parade, our set designer is a Rose Bowl Parade float designer. And he usually designs and builds at least six of the Rose Bowl floats every year. Uh, that is a lucrative business, let me tell you. And an expensive business, too. Uh, but anyway, um, I hire a designer about maybe nine months out. We talk about, we meet, he does sketches, we go back and forth. He does 3D models on the computer. 
we, uh, we, you know, we tweak, we, 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 uh, we have a sketch after sketch after sketch, he and I just uh, collaborate. Then once we get somewhere we like, something we like in rough sketch form, we give it to our technical director who's in charge of building the sets with his team of carpenters. Um, and then we create the blueprints for that construction process. The technical director does all the shopping, orders all the supplies, and then they build uh, the sets uh, in our shops. We have, we have large construction facilities on site and, and then everything gets built. And then we have another facility uh, in town, a big warehouse, that's our paint facility. So everything that we build, and it's everything, it's everything you see at Syracuse Stage is built by, by hand, from scratch, by our resident team. Everything you see. What Costume, do you do with it after you're done? We recycle. And what we can recycle, we give away to other smaller theaters or schools, and the rest goes, very little of it goes to the dumpster, but some of it doesn't go to the dumpster. So uh, uh, then it's, uh, we, we ship it over to the paint shop, and uh, they do, we, our, our, our painters paint it all, they ship it back to us. When I say ship, I mean we drive it across town. Drive it back, put it, install it, and there you go. Yes. Yes. Should I assume that the knives are used in, in the Three Musketeers are dulled? <laughs> yeah, Thank they're dulled. Thank you. They are a little dull. They're not, they can, they can make a mark. One of, one of our guys got hit in the face the other day uh, by, by accident on the flat of a blade. And it left a big mark on his face, but it didn't cut him. Yes? When, in, when do you develop your next season? Is it something ongoing, or do you it have is, a particular time? That you it is ongoing, and we do have deadlines that we have to meet. Picking of the plays is the, is the purview of myself and our associate artistic director, Kyle Bass. And we meet every Friday all year long and the topic of our 90 minute meeting is play selection. I spend a lot of my time traveling around the country, seeing plays in other theaters, seeing plays in the city, uh, seeing plays at various festivals, seeing new play festivals. So a big part of my job is to travel around and see plays. Uh, uh, and uh, so I go out and I do research and, and, and talk to other people. Uh, um, uh, we usually work on an 18 month timeline. So right now, uh, look, those are your dogs. I was trying there. to pull up the pictures. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, uh, um, so we have, uh, right now, we've picked the plays through May of 18, and now we're working on the plays that will carry us through June of, of 19. Uh, and it takes about six to eight months to go from beginning of process to end of process in terms of play selection. You, you've got to pick plays we can afford to do, plays that are going to be a diverse menu, like I talked about earlier, and plays I can get the rights to. That's a big negotiation with various agencies, is to get secure the rights to different things. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, given the size of Syracuse stage, do you have to mic the uh, actors? For musicals, we mic the actors, and for the straight plays, we don't, although we're, we're doing it differently for uh, Three Musketeers. We're miking everybody for Three Musketeers, because I mentioned that I had a composer in residence who was creating a score, so I, I wanted to mic the actors so I could control, so they wouldn't get overpowered by the score, because like those fights that you see, they're all underscore. They all have sort of dramatic music under them. Uh, and there's, but so, so this show, there will be mics. Generally speaking, we don't mic the straight plays, uh, but we do mic the musicals. So that mic system is hooked to your new audio mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the heart of your That's right. Yes, how, how much interaction does the Syracuse stage have with the immigrant community? Mm -hmm. You know, that is that's a very important <laughs> question because we have created, we have partnered with the immigrant community to, cre to create works in the past. Uh, and now with everything that's going on, we right. see ourselves re-engaging. Uh, and, and that's such, as, you, as, as everybody knows, even yesterday, there was new information about things happening and, and, and things changing. And so that is an important part of what we've done in the past in an area. I shifted us a little bit to work with veterans, and now we, and we, 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 we I was thinking that the uh, veterans might be able to interact with some of the uh, mm -hmm. immigrants. That's a good idea. Because I think that so many of our immigrants are coming from worlds we have no idea of. Absolutely. And the immigrants have, uh, the military have been in some of those, areas, those worlds Absolutely. and they might be able to have a better understanding than we as Westerners mm -hmm. have of them. Good point. That's a good point. And, so, and, and something worth exploring, absolutely. 